I do tend, to, the older I get, the, the blunter I speak about, the, about all these things. And people often tell me, well, you're just cynical. You, you know, you're just, you're not even, you don't even care anymore. And I always say the same thing. If I was cynical, then why would I be putting more energy and more of my own resources today into political activity than I did 10 years ago, 20 years ago? <coughs> to, to honestly name the state of the world in which we live is not to be cynical. I think it actually makes it possible to transcend cynicism when you are honest about the world you live in. Because then you can engage in activity, not with delusions of grandeur, because when you have unrealistic expectation, what happens? You don't win right away and then you go home. Look at the, the, the uh, movement that sprung up to try to oppose the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Right? <coughs> Many, I, you know, I recognize a lot of you in the room, we were all at the same rallies. And there was a lot of enthusiasm. Personally, I never thought the, the movement to end or to block the U.S. invasion of Iraq was going to work. I had no illusions that we were going to, in fact, be successful. I engaged in that because I thought it was the right thing to do, and I thought it might help build a stronger and more vibrant, not only anti-war, but anti-empire movement. It turns out a lot of people who came to those rallies thought we were going to win. Really thought we would, yeah. And when we didn't win and the U.S. invaded Iraq anyway, where were they after that? Well, as far as I can tell, they stayed home. Right? So I think that this kind of blunt talk and honest assessment doesn't lead to political passivity. If it does, it's leading to passivity in people who would otherwise not have been very useful anyway. I think what it does is create the conditions under which people can start to make long-term plans. For me, you know, I'm, I'm no great strategist and I'm no great organizer. Right? I, I try to look for groups where I see energy, where there's juice, where there's excitement. And so I mentioned the Workers' Defense Project. If anybody's been over to 5604 Manor, if anybody's seen that group out in you know, a rally in front of City Hall, you know they've got juice, you know there's energy there. If you look at the Third Coast Workers for Cooperation, a very small group, there's a lot of energy there, including for some of their star pupils. For instance, Red Rabbit Bakery, some of you may have heard the, the, the buzz around Red Rabbit Bakery and the most amazing vegan donuts ever to be fried in the world today. <laughs> if you, how many of you have had the Red Rabbit vegan donuts? Raise your hands. Oh my God, they're to die for. On the table. Oh my God, did you all the samples? Oh my God, I can't <laughs> wait to get vegan donuts. These are vegan donuts your mother couldn't dream of. Okay, so are vegan donuts going to save the world? No, yes. but yeah, well, yeah. I'm sorry, they are. <laughs> there must be some plan for weak old vegan donuts to be projectiles or something. Like that. <laughs> they make donuts, not war. <laughs> but you know, these are places where people are not naively believing that if we just get enough people behind the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, we're going to get some real changes in Washington. It's not going to happen. Right? It's experimenting on the ground with tangible ideas that can take root. And some of those, I think, are going to end up being the model for a different world. I don't know which ones will work. I'm not smart enough. I just know that when, it's for my, my rule these days, if there are young people with good ideas and energy, then I go there. And I, and I ask, what are you doing and how can I be a part? And th there's no shame in that. I'm 52 years old. Right? The world has never, as far as I know, the world has never been changed by 52-year-old people. Right? They are, 52-year-old people are not usually at the forefront of the cutting edge change that revolutionizes the world. That's okay. It's okay to get old, right? But it doesn't mean that 52-year-old people don't have something to contribute. We do. We have status, we have resources, we have ideas of our own. We might remember what didn't work when we tried it back. You know, there's all sorts of ways, and that's what we really have to sort of try and create. And I see it happening all over the place. It doesn't make me naively optimistic. It means that there's a place I can go to work and a place where I can live. And in the end, I think the, the real motivation, I, I hate to say this because I like to present myself as an extremely moral and noble person. But the truth is, you know, there's a lot of self-interest at work. Because when I'm working in spaces like that, when I'm part of groups like that, I feel better about myself. You know, it, it enlivens my own life. It gives me a sense that there's some purpose to what I'm doing. 
And I think that's in the end what we're all looking for. The comment was at, a, I think, a crucial question, which is, as we're out there engaged in social justice activity to try and change the world, it's easy to forget how the world changes us and how we're shaped by the culture and the dominant culture's capacity to, to undermine us. And one of the points you make <clears throat> is the way we live in a celebrity culture. And how often do critical left progressive movements throw up celebrities of their own? And how self-critical are we about that as a movement or individually? It's crucial. Uh, I mean, I'm, I teach at the University of Texas, and I've had the ability to write. And as a result of that, I get asked to speak a lot. And I think a lot about that about how it props up my, you know, my own ego. And, and should I be doing that? And what are, the, what are the, the ways in which benefits that accrue from that offset the problem? So that's a calculation I make a lot. You know, sometimes I make extra money. What can I do with that money? Sometimes I have status. For reasons that are totally uh, mysterious to me, people respect professors. I don't understand that. Even people who've been through college and suffered through professors retain a respect for professors. It totally baffles me. Right? And so how do you trade, how do you leverage that? And I, I try to create an at, or at least um, support an atmosphere where that's on the table. So in groups that were part of my status or the money I've made or the books I have, are part of the assets brought to the table. How do we use them? And the only thing I can, can say is that when that's a formal part of the conversation, when you make sure that's always on the table, then they're not individual assets, they're collective assets. And I would like to think that if the folks I work with ever said to me, you know, we've really heard enough of you, will you please sh sit down and shut them up? <laughs> because it's not doing any good anymore. Right? Okay, then I hope I'm you know, smart enough to sit down. How do people who come from a traditional left progressive analysis interact with the emerging, call it the Patriot Movement, the Tea Party Movement? Well, I think your point is well taken that that movement is not intellectually, ideologically coherent. There are some elements of that movement that I don't want to work with because they're openly racist, they're openly anti-immigrant, I think yeah. that's mostly propaganda. Right. Well, but those people exist, I know, because I get email from them. But okay. what group doesn't have a few bad apples? Well, there's a difference between a few bad apples uh -huh. and a movement that is ideologically committed to a political position that I think is reprehensible. Well, I, I don't see it here in Austin, but I have a Okay, that may be true. I don't know enough about what's on the ground here in Austin. But again, the point is, if you come from a left progressive position, where do you find the potential intersections with what are usually defined as more conservative kinds of groups? Well, sometimes those connections are quite obvious when you're talking about the nature of capitalism. Capitalism concentrates wealth. Concentrated wealth leads, leads to concentrated power. That means capitalism leads to a democracy that is consistently being undermined by a relatively small group of elites who serve that concentrated wealth. It's very simple. That's actually something that I think most ordinary people at some level get. And the question is then, what's the answer to that? Well, one answer is maybe, well, we got to get back to pure capitalism. Well, I think that's a fantasy. That's not the, the goal. Capitalism, in, in some pure form, would probably be more morally reprehensible than the bastardized form we have now. Right? So that conversation can go forward where people can offer a differing analysis of a commonly understood problem. I think the question is, where is the space for that? And that I have no good answer for because I don't see many of those spaces uh, existing. Uh, and, and so I'm, I think, at a loss to, to offer a meaningful suggestion, except maybe we can talk afterwards about how to possibly engage in that. And this is a good place to conclude, I think, because it's so central. How can we diminish the influence of money, which means the influence of concentrated wealth on politics? Right. I mean, it takes millions and millions of yeah. dollars to run for office, okay. and you know, everybody knows where that right. money comes from. It comes from corporations. Right. So it, the, you often hear that a Supreme Court decision or a law affects corporate and union contributions. 
<laughs> which assumes that these are equivalent, which of course they're not. What we're talking about is concentrated wealth and the way it undermines democracy. Concentrated wealth leads to a disruption of the democratic potential of a society, and that's quite clear. Well, this is one of those subjects that I think leads to a really healthy conversation about the fundamental nature of the economic system. The problem is not that we had this great capitalist economy and it's been hijacked somehow. You often hear this hijack narrative. This system was always designed to concentrate wealth and therefore concentrate power. The form in which it does it shifts as movements try to resist and then they're beaten back. But the problem is the nature of the economic system, capitalist, and the predominant form within which that economic activity goes forward, the corporation. The particular craziness of it right now, on which there's a lot of attention, is the legal decisions that have led over the past century or so to the American legal system treating corporations as if they were persons in various matters, including matters of freedom of expression. Well, every time I've ever asked an audience, whether it's a class or, or a public audience, whether they think corporations are in any meaningful sense persons, everybody laughs. Well, no, that's crazy. We're persons. We're people. Those corporations, whether they're the corporations we've worked for or the ones we've had to buy goods from, those aren't people in any meaningful sense. They're soulless. They're amoral by definition. So trying to, to, to latch on to that, I think, is important. Not because the corporation itself is the problem, but because the corporation in a capitalist economy <coughs> is the problem. And by entering into the discussion about the nature of corporate persons, we can lead to a, a larger and more fruitful discussion of the underlying basis of the economy and the way it will, it does and always will undermine democracy. Right? Here's the way, this is a practical, rhetorical thing. <coughs> Excuse me. I always say, we have political equality in the United States, correct? Right? Uh, one person, one vote. Free expression. Freedom of association, correct? Right? Absolutely right. right. Okay. That means that Bill Gates and I are political equals. No, that's true, because when Bill Gates goes into the voting booth, how many times does he pull the lever? Once. I go in, I pull it once. I have freedom of speech, Bill Gates has freedom of speech. If I want to start a new political party, is anybody going to stop me? No. If Bill Gates wants to, is anybody going to stop him? No. Bill Gates and I are political equals, correct? Well, you put it that way and everybody's snickering, and then at some point they break into laughter because it's an, a ludicrous proposition that Bill Gates and I are political equals. Because everyone understands that Bill Gates has at his disposal financial resources that dwarf that not only of me, but everybody in this room, our extended that families, and everybody we've ever known in our lives. <laughs> and therefore, that concentrated wealth is going to affect the distribution of power. You cannot have a democracy based on the idea, the idea of political power that is distributed in an economic system in which wealth is concentrated. That doesn't take a PhD in economics or political science. That just takes common sense. And the more times we can stand up in front of people or sit down with people at dinner and make these basic points and then open up discussion and what it will take to really create a democratic culture on the idea that it's only a democratic culture, a truly democratic culture, that's going to make it possible to work for social justice and an ecological sustainability, then at least we have the hope of moving forward. And that hope, of course, is always going to be dramatically increased by support for Monkey Wrench Books, yeah. your independent, non Thank you.